All right. Two, three, four. Let's hear you clap. I love the energy that you people have brought here to Richmond. I mean, we are making Richmond come alive. And it's people like you that are making it happen. And it's people like you who have made Richmond a city that is showing the country what we need to do to make this the century of the people. So, um, I am Eduardo Martinez, I'm part of Team Richmond along with Gail McLaughlin and Javonka Beckles. And we are going to become the next city council members along with Tom Butt as mayor. And J.L. Myrick for the two-year seat. We are going to become the most progressive city council in the United States. And we are going to show the world what a truly progressive city can do and how we can come together with love and concern for all of our citizens, for all of our residents. So uh, I'm a member of the RPA, the Richmond Progressive Alliance, yeah. and we are... <clears throat> An organization of uh, an alliance of individuals from all sorts of parties who have one vision, and that is a progressive vision, a vision that is uh, ecological, a vision that economically supports each and every individual. And it's also a social movement, a movement to make sure that all of us have the human rights and medical care that we deserve. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to introduce to you Gail McLaughlin, our current mayor. for being here tonight. I mean, this is really a wonderful, wonderful gathering of people. Such a great turnout for such a wonderful special guest we have in Bernie Sanders. Um, I'm just so honored that we have him here. And I'm so honored that we have all pulled together over these last, this last decade to work so hard together to create a better Richmond. And we have made tremendous progress. And in the next four years, we're going to create even more progress. <laughs> and and we, we've never used national and state level political gridlock as an excuse for standing by and doing nothing in our city. Instead, we've managed to become a model 21st century city in transformation, applying bold and innovative, innovative solutions to chronic problems. And we're a model for other cities to emulate. But no city is an island. Some of the problems we've been working on like stopping home foreclosures, taxing corporations fairly, creating more jobs, protecting our environment, and ensuring railway safety, they cry out for state and federal solutions as well. And it's been said that all politics is local politics. And in fact, there is no place like Richmond to experience the blatant evil of Citizens United with the Chevron Corporation. <laughs> Yeah. 
with the Chevron Corporation flooding millions of dollars to corrupt our democratic process. We need to mobilize to stop this. All over the country, we have issues. Public schools are being starved of resources. Teachers are under attack. It will take a concerted national effort by all defenders of public education to reverse these trends, no matter how much we are able to do in Richmond to make our own schools better. Our health care center is broken. Until we get Medicare for all, we... <laughs> We will just be patching up a bad system and helping private insurers and big hospital chains make even bigger profits at our expense as patients and taxpayers. The threatened closure of Doctors Hospital right here in our community is a very damaging local result of this dysfunctional market-driven system. It also represents a terrible failure of regional political leadership and corporate irresponsibility by those who claim to be for Richmond. That, that is why welcoming Senator ba uh, Bernie Sanders, the only independent member of our U.S. Senate, That's why welcoming here is such an honor and privilege for me, and I know for all of us. I know Bernie has worked hard for a, be a better nation on behalf of all of us, and I hope our local successes lend inspiration to the continued fight for our ailing nation with its growing wealth inequality and the ever-expanding corporate domination we face. The late Peter Camayo, foreign, uh, former Green Party candidate for California governor and U.S. vice president um, candidate, called what we have started in Richmond the Richmond miracle. But of course, this is no miracle. What we have done in Richmond is the result of good old-fashioned hard work and community involvement. If we have done it here, it can be done anywhere. And that's, that's the message I hope everyone holds tight in our hearts because we are truly a model for other cities. And we want to keep that transformation going so we can keep other cities learning the way from what we're doing. At this point, I want to say that I've asked two of my uh, city council colleagues, Vice Mayor Jovanka Beckles and Council Member Tom Butt, to help me welcome Bernie to Richmond by saying a few words. And let me begin by introducing our Vice Mayor, Jovanka Beckles, and say, uh, let me say a few words about her first. In her day job, Jovanka works with at-risk young people and their families. On our city council, she has responded to the needs of Richmond residents who are most often forgotten and least represented in our society. She introduced our plan for municipal IDs. She initiated our ban the box rule on job applications to offer a fair chance to returning parolees, those formerly incarcerated. And she has been a fierce champion of raising our local minimum wage law to make a start on lifting wages, lifting workers out of poverty. So please join me in welcoming Vice Mayor Jovanka Beckles. Is that cool or what? Well, welcome everybody and uh, thank you so much for such a warm welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Eduardo. And most of all, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator, for coming to our, our humble city. We are pumped, as you can see. <laughs> We're incredibly excited to have, have you. I tell you what, if, if no one's heard of, of Bernie Sanders, uh, I know that if you're on Facebook, you will have seen zillions of people sharing 
his famous quotes about equity and social justice and the environment. <laughs> I know, I know I have, I've shared quite a bit myself, uh, Senator, that's wonderful. Uh, but be before I say a few words uh, about Bernie Sanders here, I want to remind uh, those who need interpreter services, there's, we have it in the back so you can get one of the machines for that. And also, if there's anyone who is healthy and all that good stuff and are willing to give up their seat for those who are challenged physically, uh, please maybe raise your hand and those back there uh, for people who are needing to sit down, uh, those who may be disabled and seniors. Thank you very much, you guys. So we've got some seats that are People are willing to give up, okay? Thank you very much for your selflessness. Uh, was, it, was it last night? Who, who saw the Ra Rachel Maddow show? Was it last night or the night before? <laughs> that was beautiful. So last night, or the night before, I think it was, uh, on Rachel Maddow, she, she, uh, which is on uh, MSNBC, she ran an eight-minute segment titled Big Money Chevron Muscles Local Government Election. She was talking about Richmond. <laughs> so in this segment, Rachel Maddow reported on Chevron's flooding of our local elections in Richmond to install politicians who are friendly to the company, to their agenda, and more likely who will support any future project that they want regardless of how damaging and potentially harmful and, uh, it, it would be. And we don't want that. Uh, Rachel calls Chevron's attempt to buy our elections Citizens United at the local level. Now, as you know, Citizens United was a Supreme Court's decision that says corporations are people. That's a big boo, right? Because we know that that is so not the case. There you go. <laughs> They, just, they said that corporations are people, and as such, they may spend as much money as they want on political campaigns. <laughs> uh-huh, exactly. And what we're seeing here in Richmond firsthand is, is what's going on on a bigger scale in national politics. Now, it's Citizens United that allows the Koch brothers to finance right-wing causes that would not see the day of light were it not for their huge fortunes uh, behind those causes, those right-wing causes. And now the Koch brothers want to use their money to kill public transit system. Exactly. <laughs> Senator Saunders Sanders also understands how big money manages to distort every issue. For example, Senator Saunders supports amnesty and a path to citizenship to recent immigrants. But he also, yes, but he also understands that big money is trying to turn immigration reform into a way of providing cheap labor for businesses instead of helping young people, both recent immigrants and longtime residents, in order for them to get well-paying jobs. Senator Sanders has, has been one of the leaders in the fight against big money in politics. He has depended on working folks to finance his campaign, and he has shown that it is possible to stand up to the big corporate power and corporate money, uh, their big bags, on the national level. I think he has a very important message for all of us in Richmond, and I tell you, it's an honor that he recognized the fight, the struggle, the movement that is ground zero that's happening right here in Richmond. And so it's an honor for us to have him come here and uh, support the movement. So we want to hear from my, my colleague next, uh, Tom, Tom Budd, who's running for mayor, who's going to help us keep this progressive movement going. So give a big hand to Tom. Come on up, Tom. Oh, all right. <laughs> So, so before we have Tom say a few words, I would like to uh, give a few words of introduction to our um, council colleague here, uh, Tom Butt. So, 
Council member Tom Butt is like Bernie, who he hails from a rural state, and in Tom's case, the state of Arkansas. Tom, yes, Tom is the second longest serving member of our city council. He is a widely respected architect and longtime community leader in historical preservation projects. He has been a pioneer in the fight for clean energy, community policing, and most important of all, holding Chevron accountable to the people of Richmond. <laughs> As a young man, he, like others in our audience tonight, was a member of our armed forces in Vietnam. That costly and tragic conflict, like many others since, has created an enormous need for veterans benefits, health care treatment, and other services that our federal government has too often failed to provide. Senator Sanders, while a peace activist himself in the 60s, has been a consistent and effective advocate for improving and expanding the Veterans Administration Hospital system that serves millions of Americans. So, <laughs> before Bernie speaks, I've asked Tom to say a few words about why we need someone like Bernie as chairman of the Senate Committee on Vet Veterans Affairs instead of a hypocritical health care budget cutting VA privatizing, chicken hawk Republican. <laughs> so, so, Tom. <laughs> so, I just want to take my brief time here tonight to thank the Senator for his leadership on the Senate Veteran Affairs Committee. This is really important, and it's something that affects so many people, and believe it or not, it's not politically easy to do. Uh, Gail has already betrayed my age by revealing that I am a Vietnam veteran. Uh, but, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, Veterans Administration uh, does so much, and as a matter of fact, within a year of the time that I came back from Vietnam, I attended graduate school at UCA, UCLA on the GI Bill. And uh, that's something that, uh, that it did for me that's still available. But I think more importantly, the issue we see today are issues involving uh, the health, not only of veterans that are returning from Afghanistan and Iraq, but, but the veterans that are, that are my age. Uh, I'm lucky, I've been blessed with good health, but I can tell you that a, that a lot of people whom I served with are not. They are suffering from uh, from diseases, diseases like, uh, like stroke and Parkinson's and diabetes that are service-connected uh, disabilities that they have. They are, are, are collecting disability payments for these from the Veterans Administration. And it hasn't been easy for them. It's been really hard. I even have uh, one very good friend who died from complications of PTSD from his service in Vietnam. So. Uh, this is really important. And you know, the, the thing that most people, a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the cost of these foreign wars does not end when the troops come home. The cost goes on for decades and decades and decades. And as a matter of fact, the total cost uh, may actually exceed the cost of actually being in a war. So, uh, Senator, I want to thank you again for your leadership in Veterans Affairs. Uh, it's, it's, And that's it. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you to uh, uh, Vice, Mayor, Vice Mayor Beckles and Councilmember Tom Butt. And now I have the, the pleasure of introducing Senator Bernie Sanders. Let me, let me start out by saying both Bernie Sanders and I have been mayors. And in that role, we have much in common. We both won our first election as mayor in spite of the fact that the so-called experts in each city at the time didn't give us outsiders of the two-party system much of a chance against a well-known incumbent Democrat. But in 1981 and in 2006 here in Richmond, enough voters wanted to make that change happen. But getting elected, 
as we all know, is just the beginning. Then you have to succeed in the real work of making City Hall work for the people in your first term and in later ones if you are granted them. Bernie served with national distinction as mayor of Burlington for eight years, winning four straight elections. Constrained by term limits, I will have matched his tenure in office, serving two four-year terms, and this is my eighth year of service as mayor myself. So I'm very proud to have that in common with the senator. Um, a lot of powerful local business interests and old guard, union, and political forces try to stand in the way of progress in both of our cities. People throughout the nation, including here in Richmond, gained inspiration from the experience of Bernie Sanders and Vermont progressives three decades ago in Burlington. It is so clear that we can accomplish all kinds of things for people. If you, if you make the, the job of mayor a bully pulpit and help mobilize labor, environmental, social justice groups, and low-income people in your city, giving them a voice and common direction they've never had before. So please, Join me in welcoming a former mayor, a former congressman, and now U.S. Senator who is one of a kind in America. He's an inspiration to us all and maybe just the kind of mainstream party crasher we need in 2016, <laughs> Bernie Sanders. <laughs> In case you haven't noticed, there are a lot of people here. Thank you all very, very much for coming out. And Gail, thank you for that introduction. And I am here to be as supportive as I can for this ticket that's going to bring people together, that it's going to give Chevron a lesson that they've never forgot. So with your help on election night, you're going to have Tom and Gail and Javanka and Eduardo in office to do the right things for this community. Now, I came here tonight uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, as Gail mentioned, I was a former mayor. I served for eight years. We have two-year terms in Burlington. And in that capacity uh, of taking on then the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the railroad, the state, the utilities, the restaurants, the entire Chamber of Commerce, everybody else, we took them all on. And here are some of the lessons that I learned, which I think you know very, very well. Back then, there was a great deal of political alienation. I think it's worse today. Profound anger and disgust. But this is what happened, and I'm sure that it's happening, and this turnout tonight tells me it's happening in Richmond. I ran for office on a plank which said, you know, I'm not here to represent the big money interests. I'm here to represent the middle class and working families and low-income people in my community. And we had a plank, and we laid it out and the members of the city council, I had two supporters on the city council at the time, 11 against me. <laughs> and at the first meeting, first meeting we had, the majority took away my one appointee. I had to serve my entire first year. The mayor in Burlington is entitled to a city attorney, treasurer, a whole bunch of appointees. They refused to allow me to have my appointees. So I had to run my first year with the group of folks who were loyal to the guy I had beaten in a very contentious election. Try that. <laughs> Do you know what happened? Because we kept faith with the people, because we did what we promised we would do, 
Two years later, we doubled voter turnout. Doubled voter turnout. And low-income people, and working-class people, middle-class people came out in huge numbers. And in my races, I was able to be Democrats, Republicans, Democrats, and Republicans. And at the end, they combined around one candidate, beat them also. All right. Which always, I never forget, that when you're honest, when you're willing to fight for working families, when you're willing to stand up to the powers that be, and you keep your word, people will stand with you, and that's what's going to happen here in Richmond. The other reason that I am here is not just to applaud Gail and all of those who have worked with Gail for their creative solutions to serious problems. I love municipal government, I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the day, establishing community, bringing people together, creating a sense of place where people feel good about each other, that's the best that we can do. And that's what you could do at the local level. And I have been very impressed by everything that I've heard about what Gail and her team has done uh, in trying to improve life for people in Richmond. So I'm really happy to be here and be supportive of that. But the second reason I am here, I think Javanka made this point, is that we are facing an enormous crisis in this country. By a five to four vote, the Supreme Court made what I think will go down in history as one of the worst decisions ever made by a Supreme Court in American history. And the result of that decision was to give the Koch brothers, Chevron, and the billionaire class, and all of corporate America, the opportunity to spend unlimited, unlimited sums of money in races for the White House, for the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, governor's chairs, and even municipal elections like here in Richmond, even school board elections around the country. Apparently, for these guys, owning and controlling our economy is not enough. They now want to own and control the government, and we are not going to allow them to do that. Not in Richmond, not anywhere. Now, when you talk about money in politics, the difficulty is trying to explain to ordinary people how much money these guys have, because it's really unimaginable. You know, most people think about $100, $1,000, $10,000. I'll just give you one example. The Koch brothers are the second wealthiest family in America. They're worth something like 85 billion dollars. In one year alone, in the last year, their wealth increased by 12 billion dollars. Now, they are extreme right-wing ideologues who increased their wealth in one year by 12 billion. When Obama and Romney ran for president, in 2012, both of them spent a little bit more than a billion dollars on their campaign. For the Koch brothers, a billion dollars is like $20 for ordinary Americans. In one year, $12 billion increase in wealth, $85 billion. They could spend $5 billion. It would have no impact on, essential impact or what they're worth. So for them, the only question, and it's hard for people to understand this, the only question is when does too much become counterproductive? It is not a question of how much, it just went too much, because they have literally 
unlimited sums of money. Now let me tell you what else these guys want to do. Citizens United was, as I think we all understand, a horrendous decision. That's not enough for them. And you all have got to understand them. Back in 1980, and I want to get into this a little bit, David Koch, one of the brothers, ran for Vice President of the United States on the Libertarian Party. And he helped fund that effort. And they had a party platform that he helped to write. And one of the important provisions in that platform, which is now coming into effect unless we stop them, is to say, and I quote, this is from his 1980 campaign, quote, we urge the repeal of federal campaign finance laws and the immediate abolition of the despotic Federal Election Commission. That position is now the position of the leadership of the National Republican Party. What does that mean in English? Right now, they can spend as much as they want through independent expenditures. Those ads you see on television, tell somebody to do this and all that stuff, that's an independent expenditure. They have to go to a super PAC to fund vote yes, vote for this person or that person. This is where they want to go. This is where the Republican Party today wants to go. They want the day when all campaign finance law is repealed so that the Koch brothers could stand in front of a group like this, well, not quite like this, <laughs> but have their candidates and say, you want to run for governor of California? I've got a $100 million check for you. There's your speechwriter. There's your media consultant. You work directly for me. So they want a, another 100 employees in the U.S. Senate, another 435 in the House, and a big one in the White House. That is their vision of what democracy is about. And on the other side of the equation, they have another vision. Most of us learn that what democracy is about is one person, one vote. And in Vermont, we have what we call town meetings in March, and people come out, whole town comes out, people argue about the road budget and the school budget and this, that, and the other thing. Everybody has one vote. What they are now trying to do through Republican governors and legislatures around this country, because they are cowards and they cannot defend their political point of view, is suppress the vote. You would think that somebody who believed in what they stood for, and I'm going to tell you in a moment exactly what they stand for, you would believe that they would have the guts to go out and try to convince people. This is what I believe. This is what my opponent believes. Vote for me. That's called democracy. But they're cowards. And they hide behind their money and what they are trying to do right now in many, many states is make it difficult for seniors for low-income people, for people of color, for young people to participate in the political process. They are cowards. Shame on them. Now, before I get into the thrust of my remarks, I want to do something that is done too rarely and the corporate media does not cover. We can all be appalled that billionaires are spending huge sums of money. I think that's on the surface detrimental to democracy and not what this country is supposed to be about. But it is important to understand why is the Koch family spending, we don't know exactly because a lot of this money is undisclosed, but we're guessing three, four, five hundred million dollars on this election alone. What do they stand for? What do they want? I'm going to tell you what they want. I told you a moment ago that David Koch ran for vice president in 1980. I am going to read some, just some, of his platform. And you will be stunned by what I read, but to the very best of my knowledge, while this platform was written 34 years ago, their views have not changed. And they got think tanks 
all over this country, you name the issue. Tom was talking about veterans issues. They got a Koch Brothers Veterans Organization. You talk about a health care. They got a health care organization. They got a tax organization. They got an education organization. And they're on television every night. This is what the Koch Brothers platform was in 1980, a platform which has not changed. We favor, this is quote, exact quotes, we favor the abolition of Medicare and Medicaid programs. You all are aware that the Republican House of Representatives last year voted to end Medicare as we know it, to transform it into a voucher system, which means that if you are old and sick, you're 75, you come down with cancer, their vision for your health care is a check for $8,000 to go to any private insurance company you want. You're 75, you got cancer, and you got a check for $8,000. Tell me how many days that's going to keep you in the hospital. That's right. Maybe hours, not days. That's their vision. Medicaid, huge cuts in Medicaid for low-income people. But that is not enough. The vision of the Koch brothers is to end Medicare and Medicaid and other public health programs entirely. Next point, and I quote, we favor, this is quote, we favor the repeal of the fraudulent, virtually bankrupt, and increasingly oppressive social security system. Now, many of us, and I know people in this room, work with me, work with your Senator Barbara Boxer, and others to say we are not going to cut Social Security. There was a proposal called the so-called chain CPI, which would have cut cost of living increases, and we put together senior groups and veterans groups and women's groups and the trade union movement, people with disabilities, we brought everybody together, formed the caucus in the Congress, and we beat them back. But Koch brothers are not talking about cutting Social Security. They want to eliminate Social Security. Quotes, we support we support repeal of all law which impede the ability of any person to find employment, such as minimum wage laws, end of quote. Do you know what that means? Right now, and I think Gail was talking about this a moment ago, everybody in this room understands that a seven and a quarter federal minimum wage is a starvation wage. And we've got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. There is, we brought forth a bill in the Senate, didn't go as far as I would like it to go. It was for 1010 an hour, which would have lifted over 25 million Americans, given them a pay raise, people who needed it the most, the moms, trying to get by on $9 an hour, $9.50 an hour. It would have been good help. We could get virtually no Republican support for that. The Koch brothers' view is, of course you don't want to raise the minimum wage, you want to eliminate the concept of the minimum wage. So that in high unemployment areas, if you have workers fighting for a few jobs, they're going to say, I've got a job, it pays four bucks an hour. You don't want it, i got ten other people who want it. They want to eliminate all federal health and safety laws to protect workers on the job. That's their vision for America. Quote, listen to this. Quote, we support the complete separation of education and state. Government schools lead to the indoctrination of children and interfere with the free choice of individuals. Do you know what that means in English? The end of public education. So if you are a wealthy person, no problem. 
You're going to send your kids to a good private school. But if you are a working class person, you're a low income person, what are your kids going to have? Nothing. They want to end all federal aid for higher education, Pell Grants. They want to end the ability of states to run state colleges and state universities. Quote, we support the abolition of the Environmental Protection Agency. In other words, their idea of freedom is that a corporation, maybe an Exxon, can dump its crap into the air, get kids sick, pollute our water, pollute our land, and that's called freedom. And you don't want to interfere with the freedom of those corporations to destroy our air, land, and water, do you? You don't want to have legislation to protect the health of our kids. That's their view. Quote, and there are many, many others equally shocking. Here's one that really gives you the totality of where they are coming from. Quote, we oppose all government welfare, relief projects, and aid to the poor programs. All these government programs are privacy invading, paternalistic, demeaning, and inefficient. The proper source of help for such persons is the voluntary efforts of private groups and individuals, end of quote. Now, you know what that means? That means unemployment compensation, gone. Head Start, gone. Food stamps, gone. You name the federal program, Meals on Wheels, gone. And their vision is that you will have a few rich people, and if you're really nice to them, they may throw you out. You're hungry? Well, they may throw you some crumbs, or maybe not. But they will control what goes on. And you're seeing that. You're seeing a little of that right here in this small city. Unlimited sums of money from one of the largest corporations in America who says, how dare you, ordinary people, working class people, people of color, young people, how dare you think you have a right to run your city government? Who do you think you are? We're going to teach you a lesson. We're going to tell you who owns this community, who controls this community. And that's what this fight is about here in Richmond. And you damn well better win that fight. Because whether you know it or not, whether you know it or not, I think Gail said it, the eyes of the country are on you. And if Chevron can roll over you, they'll roll over, they and their buddies will roll over every community in America. If you can stand up and beat them with all of their money, you're going to give hope to people all over America that we can control our destiny. Now, what I want to do for a moment is, is deal with a subject that is terribly important that we don't talk about enough. If you were to ask me what the great crisis facing America is, the answer is that we don't discuss the great crises facing America. That's the great crisis. So what I want to do for a moment, what I want to do for a moment is do what you don't see on TV just not on TV, you don't see in the papers very often. And as I want to tell you, in my view, back by fact, what in fact is going on in the United States of America. And then I want to tell you what I believe we have to do to turn this country around. Now, we all know that there are a lot of angry people out there. Some of them are slightly misguided and work within the Tea Party. And they are very angry, but unfortunately, they're angry at the wrong people for the wrong reasons, and we've got to help them get their thinking together. And there are other people in the Occupy movement who are angry at the right people for the right reasons.
But there are a lot of people who are angry. And you know what? The American people should be angry. And I'm going to tell you why they should be angry. And some of them understand it intellectually, but everybody understands it emotionally. I want you to think about what's gone on in this country for the last 30, 40 years. And what's gone on is we have seen an explosion of technology. These little things, space age technology, robotics, you know, unbelievable technology. And what's the result of technology? What technology does is make every worker far more productive than he or she used to be. So if I give you a tool and you are producing 30% more than somebody did 10 years ago, what you might logically think is you're going to be making 30% more money, or maybe, maybe you'll be working 30% fewer hours. <laughs> you know? And on that, let me tell you a funny story on that one. All right, settle in. This may go on for a while here. When I was a young man in college, this is true. For the young people, you think I'm not telling you the truth. This is true. They taught courses about what Americans should do with all of the leisure time that they would have as a result of exploding technology. And you're laughing. In fact, now the courses they teach is how you can survive in a stressed out family when mom and dad are working three jobs. And that is, of course, the reality of America today. So people are asking themselves, they're saying, with all of this new technology, with all of this new productivity, with all of this great global economy and all these trade agreements, how come I am working longer hours for lower wages? How come when I am 55 years of age, I'm suddenly getting laid off because I was making too much money and I'm replaced by a 20-year-old young person? How's that happening? So listen up, and there's the facts that are impacting the reality of the middle class today. Since 1999, the typical, that middle class family, right in the middle of the economy, half the people above, half the people below, that family has seen its income go down by almost $5,000 after adjusting for inflation. Incredibly, that same family, right in the middle of the economy, earned almost $500 less last year than it did 25 years ago. So people are saying, what's going on? I'm working hard, my wife is working hard, we're working longer hours and we're worse off as a family than we were 25 years ago. Typical, that again, that median worker, right in the middle, that male worker, made $780 less last year than he did 41 years ago, adjusted for inflation. That typical woman worker earned $1,300 less last year than she did in 2007. In other words, the working class of this country is on the move. The problem is we're moving in the wrong direction. We're moving down rather than up. Now the president gets on the TV and he makes an important point and it's an, a point not to be dismissed. The Republicans dismiss it. And he says correctly, think about where we were six years ago. You think we're not creating enough jobs today? That's true, no debate. Six years ago, we were losing 700,000 jobs a month. Six years ago, the financial system of this country and the world was on the verge of collapse. Put your credit card into an ATM, no money might come out. Talk about deficits, we ran up a $1.4 trillion deficit under Bush's last year. So have we made progress? Yes. Have we made anywhere near the kind of progress we need to address the economic problems facing working people? Absolutely not. Now when you talk to people, in every poll, no matter what the poll is, who does it, the result is always the same. They say to people, okay, what is the most important issue on your mind? And what people say is jobs and the economy. Now, you may have read in the paper 
that according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, unemployment, official unemployment, is 5.9%. If you include those people who have given up looking for work and those people who are working part-time where they want to work full-time, do you know what real unemployment in America is? It's close to 12%. Do you know, do you know what youth unemployment is today? It is 20%. Do you know, everybody here has heard a lot about Ferguson, Missouri. And we heard about the tragedy of an unarmed black man shot to death. That is a tragedy. But what they forgot to tell you is that African American youth unemployment in this country is over 30%. In this country today, you want to know why people are anxious? why they are upset, why they're stressed out. Half of the families in this country have less than $10,000 in the bank. So you're getting old, you're thinking about retirement. How the hell do you retire with less than $10,000 in the bank? You're a divorce, you're an automobile injury, you're a job loss away from financial disaster. When we talk about what's happening in the middle class today, it's important to understand, and again, young people may think I'm not telling the truth, but to the young people I would say, there was once a time in America where you could walk into a department store and you could actually buy products made in the United States of America, not China. And by and large, those jobs paid good wages. Since 2001 in this country, we have lost 60,000 factories. 60,000 factories and millions of decent paying jobs, largely because of a disastrous set of trade policies that said to corporate America, go to China, go to Mexico, go to Vietnam, and you can bring your products back into this country tariff-free. And I believe, and having voted against all of those trade agreements. I believe... I believe that if corporate America wants us to buy their products, they damn well should make those products right here in America. Now, in one sentence, a long sentence, but in one sentence, we can see the transformation of the American economy. 30 years ago, the largest private sector employer in America was General Motors. Strong union, the UAW, decent wages, strong health care benefits, pension benefits. Today, the largest private sector employer in America is? Exactly. Low wages, virtually no benefits, vehemently anti-union. That, in one metaphor, is the transformation of the American economy from a company that made real products, paid real wages, to Walmart. And by the way, when we talk about Walmart, you should all know, and I'm sure you'll be happy to know this, that Walmart is owned by the Walton family, which is the wealthiest family in America. They're struggling with about $148 billion, okay? Trying to get by, it's tough, tough. But here is the outrage. The outrage is that because Walmart pays wages which are so low, because Walmart does not provide decent health care to its workers, you end up subsidizing Walmart because a significant number of their people go on food stamps, go on to federally funded housing, go on to Medicaid. Medicaid. So all of us are saying to the Walton family, you're the richest family in America, how about paying your workers a living wage? We're tired of you. Now what's happening in the country, and this is also just a, a strange moment, you know, if a tornado goes through a town, 
You know, and like tornado levels everybody. There's a certain sense, this is a tragedy. Our whole town has been hit by a flood, a tsunami, whatever it may be. But as all of you know, there's something else going on in the economy today. The middle class is disappearing. We have more people living in poverty today than almost any time in American history. But there's another reality. And the other reality is that the wealthiest people and the largest corporations are doing phenomenally well. So it's not like everybody is in the same boat. People on top are doing phenomenally well at exactly the same time as we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth. The rich are doing extraordinarily well at the same time as we have seniors struggling whether or not to pay for their prescription drugs or to pay for their food. In America today, we have more income and wealth inequality than at any time since 1929. And by the way, you all know what happened in 1929. And that's not an accident, not an accident. But we have more wealth and income inequality in this country since 1929 and more inequality than any other major country on earth. You know, we all think about our friends over in the United Kingdom and they got queens and dukes and lords and whatever the hell they got, no one can figure out. But they got all of these guys and we say, that's a really class-oriented country. We have more inequality in terms of wealth and income than they have. Today in America, the top 1% own 37% of the financial wealth of the country. That's bad. This is worse. The bottom 60% own all of 1.7%. You'll follow that? Okay. In fact, it gets worse. The top one-tenth of 1% 1 own over 23% of total wealth. Got that? One-tenth of 1% 1 own over 23% of the wealth in America. The Walton family, our good friends at Walmart, those generous benefactors, they alone own more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people. One family. It is obscene. It is exactly what it is. Now, that's wealth. Wealth is what you accumulate in your entire life. In terms of income, which is what we made in the last year, since the Wall Street crash, which was caused, as I hope everybody here knows, by the greed, recklessness, and illegal behavior of Wall Street, since that time, listen to this, 95% of all new income created in America since 2008 has gone to the top 1%. So what that means is that, you know, economists look at growth in the economy. Did the GDP grow by 2%, 4%? Was it really good in 6%? And that's important. But in a certain sense, it doesn't make any difference to the average person if all of the new income associated with that growth goes to the top 1%. So the reality is where we are today, and again, this is an issue that we just don't talk about. Television doesn't talk about it. Just go out. Each family thinks they're the only family struggling. They're not. That is the vast majority of the American people. So where we are today, the people on top doing phenomenally well, everybody else hurting. In my, city, in my state of Vermont, yesterday, I believe, two days ago, in one of our larger towns, teachers went out on strike because the school district wanted to cut their health benefits, something that's happening all over America. Today in America, the top 25 hedge fund managers, and no one quite knows what a hedge fund manager does, but we do know that these 25 guys, and I suspect they are all guys, made more than $24 billion. That is enough to pay the full salaries for 425,000 public school teachers. What about that for national priorities? Today, corporate profits are at an all-time high, 
and CEOs earn about 270 times what their employees make, their average employee. Now many in, sitting in Washington are going to hear corporate America every day, oh God, they're just taxed to the, to the death, they just, it's unbelievable. Poor right, poor babies. Well, you should know, as I'm sure you do, that one out of four corporations pays nothing in federal income tax, and the wealthy and large corporations avoid paying about $100 billion every single year. You know why? Because, that's right, Chevron too. Because they stash their money in tax havens like the Cayman Islands or Bermuda. All right, so that's where we are today. Now what I want to talk about for a moment, and I want to make this as, as strongly as I can. All of these things that are happening were created by human activities, were created by bad public policy. That's why we are where we are. Not an accident. This was people, big money interest, pushed this agenda. Let me give you a progressive agenda. I know Gail and others. <laughs> Gail and others are fighting for a progressive local agenda. Let me give you an agenda for Washington. First of all, as I mentioned, real unemployment is 12%, youth unemployment 20%. What we need to do is pass legislation that pushes a major federal jobs program to re which rebuilds our crumbling infrastructure. That is roads and bridges and rail systems and water systems and wastewater plants. When I was mayor of Burlington, we had to work with the state and the feds helped to come up with $50 million back in the 1980s for a wastewater plant. Very, very expensive. Gail, would a little federal money help? Rebuilding your infrastructure here? All right. And when we do that, let me give you an example. The American Society of Civil Engineers. It's a very sexy title. But these guys analyze the state of our infrastructure. They say we need to put $3 trillion into rebuilding our infrastructure. Now, interestingly enough, $3 trillion is just about what we spent on the war in Iraq, a war we should never have gotten into in the first place. If we are conservative and just take, and I would go further than this, but you take one trillion dollars, you can have a profound impact in improving the infrastructure of America, and you can put 13 million Americans back to work at decent wages, which is exactly what we have to do. And not only do we, we talk about the economy and jobs, not only, of course, do we have to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, we have to make sure in this country that equal work gets equal pay, that women do not get paid 77 cents on the dollar compared to men. And very significantly, again, it's an issue that is not discussed. Really, you can raise your hands if anybody here has seen a television program dealing with our trade policy and the impact of it. Anyone ever see a program? <laughs> now, it is, as I mentioned a moment ago, we've lost 60,000 factories in the last 14, 15 years. You think maybe, maybe we should be talking about it. But what we have got to do is end these disastrous trade policies Corporate America is going to invest back in this country. But obviously, a progressive agenda has got to go further than that. We are living in a highly competitive global economy, and if this country is to succeed economically, we have got to have the best educated workforce in the world. And here is a depressing fact, just a depressing fact. 30 years ago, 
this nation led the world in terms of the percentage of our people who graduated college. We were number one. Today, we are number 12. Before I came in here, I was talking to a couple of women who I think are here. One was teaching at a, a local college. And we were talking about the fact that not so many years ago, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, the University of California, one of the great university systems in the world, was tuition free. Some of you may have read that one of the states in Germany became the last state to abolish tuition in Germany. We had the ambassador from Denmark visiting us in Vermont, not this summer, but the summer before, talking about how kids in Denmark go to college, graduate school, and medical school. You know how much it costs them? That's right, zero. So maybe, just maybe, if we want to have the kind of economy we need, decent jobs, decent wages, maybe we should learn something from Germany and Denmark and make sure that every young person in this country can go to college regardless of his or her income. A couple of months ago in Vermont, we had a meeting on student indebtedness. And I talked to a young woman whose crime was that she went to medical school and is now doing an excellent job practicing primary health care in a community health center. She came out of medical school $300,000 in debt. All right. Right now, we have young people paying 5, 6, 8% on their interest rates. We have parents paying even more again for the crime of wanting to see their kids get a decent education. During the Wall Street bailout period, I managed to get an amendment passed in the Dodd-Frank financial bill. And the amendment for the first time allowed for an audit of the Federal Reserve during the financial crisis. And you know what we learned? This is what we learned during that crisis period to a revolving loan fund, the Fed lent out $16 trillion to every, virtually every financial institution in America, central banks all over the world, large corporations at interest rates of zero or one half of one percent. Now, if you could bail out Wall Street and give them Fed money at one half of one percent, maybe we could do the same for the young people going to college. And while we're at it, when we talk about young people, and when we understand that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth, almost one out of five of our kids lives in poverty. I want you to think for a moment. You're a mom, maybe a single mom, and you're going to work. You're trying your hardest to bring up your kid well. What happens to the kid when you're at work? Can you find good quality, affordable child care? And the answer in Vermont and the answer in California is you can. So we have got to create an understanding that the most important years of a human being's life are zero to three. That's what all the studies tell us. And we need hundreds of thousands of well-educated, well-trained, well-paid childcare workers to make sure that our kids get off with a good start in life. Let me say about a word that is dear to my heart because I've worked very, very hard on this. When we talk about what the Koch brothers want, what their vision of America is about, what is it is about is a world in which we have repealed virtually every piece of legislation 
passed since the 1930s, where a handful of billionaire families control the economy and they will dole it out to people as they choose. And always at the top of the list of programs they want to eliminate is Social Security. And you know why they want to eliminate Social Security? Because Social Security is the most successful federal program in the modern history of America. That's why they want to eliminate it. So for years now, you turn on the TV and they have these guys getting up there and saying, well, we need entitlement reform. Have you ever heard that phrase? Do you know what they're talking about? When they talk about entitlement reform, they're too cowardly to tell you what they really are talking about. What they're talking about is cuts in Social Security and in Medicare. And here's the big lie. Well, we've got to cut Social Security because it's going broke. So let me tell you the truth. Social Security ain't going broke. That's two and a half trillion dollars in the trust fund. Not going broke. Social Security can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American for the next 19 years. And if you want to extend Social Security for decades more, you know what you do? You lift the cap. So that somebody who's making a million or five million does not continue paying the same into the fund as somebody making 117. Now, some nice things on this issue have been happening. What is happening now is more and more people are saying, not only are we not going to cut Social Security, we're going to expand Social Security benefits. And that's the right answer. This morning in San Francisco, I had the opportunity of meeting with and marching with the United Nurses of America. And what they understand, as well as an increasing number of doctors, mostly primary care physicians, is they as nurses, doctor as doctors, cannot do their job under the current dysfunctional health care system. The Affordable Care Act has done some good things. We've got about 10 million more people who have insurance. That's good. We've done away with pre-existing conditions, etc. Some good things. But what we have got to recognize, and I hope all of you know, that today the United States of America is the only major country on earth that does not guarantee health care to all people as a right of citizenship. And in my view, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart, we have got to move toward a Medicare for all single payer system. maximize profits for the drug companies and the insurance companies is a system which distorts medical and health care needs in this country. We should be spending more on disease prevention. We should make prescription drugs affordable for all of our people. We should greatly expand the number of primary care doctors and nurses that we have so that anybody gets ill, they walk into a doctor when they need to get that. You've been very patient, and I just want to make a few other points. I'm on, uh, in addition to being chairman of the Veterans Committee, and as uh, Tom indicated, we work very, very hard. We did something very unusual in Washington these days. We actually passed legislation. <laughs> among other things, we got $5 billion into the VA to bring in new doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals. But I also sit on both the Energy Committee and the Environmental Committee, which is chaired, by the way,
by Barbara Boxer, who does a very, very good job. Barbara and I work together on many, many issues. And one of the issues we understand, because we see the scientists coming before us, we see the best scientists, not only in America, but all over the world. And what they tell us is climate change is real, Climate change is caused significantly by human activity and the emission of carbon. Climate change in California, Vermont, all over this world is already causing devastating problems. And if we do not get our act together, those problems will only become worse in terms of drought, which you're experiencing, flooding, rising sea levels, extreme weather disturbances which hit my state a few years ago. So if we have any concern for our kids and our grandchildren, we have the moral responsibility to stand up to the fossil fuel industry, transform our energy system. Big deal. People argue about how good or bad they are doing. 
That's where we want to be as a country. I'll give you another example. When I was growing up, if a kid with disabilities was born, Down syndrome or whatever, there was often embarrassment and shame in that family. Children at a, with disabilities at a very young age were institutionalized, kids were hidden, and think how far we have come to embrace people with disabilities. They are part of our community, we love them, we respect them, they're mainstream in our schools. We have come a huge way in embracing people with disabilities. A very significant step. And last but certainly not least, if we were sitting here not 30 years ago, but 10 years ago, and somebody here would have said, you know, I think in 10 years you're going to have conservative states voting or allowing gay marriage. <laughs> you would have thought that person was really crazy. And I will tell you from a personal experience, Vermont was the first state in the country to pass civil unions, not gay marriage, civil unions. Okay? And I remember that during that period, a lot of hostility and bitterness. No gifts and bucks a bunch of years later, Vermont became the first state in the country without a court order to pass gay marriage. Nobody knows. Not a big deal. And when I talk to young people in my state, I go to a lot of the high schools in my state, I go to some of the conservative areas of the state, and I say to kids, well, I want you to raise your hand if you think that uh, you support gay marriage. And the kids kind of look at you like, duh. <laughs> now their grandparents look at it differently. But, you know, that's why the Republicans have given up and backed off their homophobia, because it's a losing issue. But again, on all of these issues, the civil rights struggle, how many people died, how many people went to jail, the struggle for women's rights, women died, went to jail, male allies stood with them, disability rights, gay rights, Nothing happened easily. It never does. And where we are right now is at a unique moment. We should be proud. Sometimes we don't slap ourselves on the back enough. We should be proud of the very profound changes we have made to make this society a less discriminatory society. Real change. And many of you, over your lifetimes, were engaged in those struggles in one way or another. But today, that's right, give yourself a hand because you did it. But today we are engaged in another struggle, in an area where we have not made progress, and in fact, where we have lost ground, and that is the economic struggle. We've lost ground. And the danger right now, and I, and I use these words advisedly, sometimes people think I'm overly dramatic, but I'm not. I worry very much that if present trends condition, continue, we will see this country become an oligarchic form of society and not a democratic form of society. The Chevrons of the world, the Koch brothers and the others, they are very religious people. Their religion is greed. And they are prepared to step on anybody and everybody who gets in their way. So my message to all of you is that in this profoundly important moment in American history, where the billionaire class wants it all, that for the sake not only of us, but more importantly for our kids and our grandchildren, I have seven beautiful grandchildren, for them and all of your kids and your grandchildren, we have got to fight back tooth and nail. We cannot allow them. We cannot allow them to take over Richmond. We cannot allow them to take over America. And if we do our job, and if we knock on doors and talk to our neighbors, we are going to beat them, and that's what we've got to do. Thank you all very, very much.